would be roughly 16 years wait between Sleepaway Camp 4's collapse and the next entry in the series. Frankly, after seeing 2008's Return to Sleepaway Camp, also known as The Passion of the Allen for those who've seen it before, I really, truly and honestly wish it had stayed dead. I went into this film blind. I mean, I knew it existed, I wasn't that blind, but I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was that it was a direct sequel to the first film that ignored the events of Sleepaway Camp 2-4, and what I ended up experiencing here was quite possibly the most annoying film I've seen in the last three years, and a definite top three contender for most annoying film I've ever seen ever of all time ever ever. So determined this film was to see me lose my temper with it for being a screechy, drab, predictable mess that I feel I deserve some kind of achievement or recognition for the fact that I subjected myself to this just for your consideration. Well, I watched the whole thing from titles to end credits and I feel 100% confident in being able to say that in my opinion, you should never go near this film. Hell, if you make it past the first 15 minutes and actually want to watch the rest of this absolute cinematic travesty, then you're either a masochist or you're not watching it properly. The film was written and directed by Robert Hiltzik, returning here after nearly 25 years absence from the scene. Seriously, most of his credits are inspired by credits with the exception of this film and the original Sleepaway Camp. But having seen the calibre and quality of the first Sleepaway Camp, a film I genuinely enjoy, it's a great little slasher, the opportunity for this one-shot writer to revisit and expand his universe 25 years on and throw out another hearty dose of slightly bizarre and startling cinema was just too good an opportunity to pass up, really. They say that time can be your own worst enemy when it comes to art. Guns N' Roses had Chinese democracy, the games industry had Jeep Nukem Forever, and amongst the many, 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 many films that have flopped or worse been totally awful or unwatchable, there sits Return to Sleepaway Camp. But I've built it up enough, let's get to the part where I tear this movie a new one, eh? Return to Sleepaway Camp takes place 25 or so years after the events of the original Sleepaway Camp. The film opens with a quite neat and brief recap of the events of the first film via newspaper clippings running over the opening titles. One thing I do like about this movie is that within those newspaper clippings they also give a few hints as to what exactly happened after the events of the first Sleepaway Camp movie, and they set up the intro to this movie. Basically, Angela was arrested, the full details of her mad aunt's transgender scheme were outed in court, and Angela was locked in an asylum upstate, never to be released again. Camp Arawak was closed down and remained dormant until a year or two before this film starts, where it was renamed Camp Manabe to help distance itself from its bloody past. We're then introduced to Alan. Literally, and I don't use this word lightly, the worst character it has ever been my misfortune to be stuck with for 90 minutes. Alan is a bully, Alan is obnoxious, Alan is rude, Alan screeches a lot, Alan wants to do whatever he wants, Alan gets bullied by the camp counsellors and some of the older campers mentally and physically, but that's okay because Alan gives as good as he gets most of the time. Alan is every annoying quality you could manifest onto a character incarnate. He doesn't wash, he eats like a duck, he's a rampant pervert and border stalker towards one of the female campers. I hate him. So much. And in the first 11 minutes of the film he does his level best to truly, deeply let you know just how unpleasant he's going to be for the rest of the movie. And like how tropical frogs sometimes have vivid and extreme colouring warning you to stay away, Alan's incoherent aggressive awfulness does its level best to get you to hit your Blu-ray player's eject button as quickly as possible. He doesn't get any better either, by the way. He's just permanently locked into screeching degenerate for the full runtime. It doesn't stop. It never stops. 
Anyway, so Alan and his stepbrother are at Camp Manabe, and Alan doesn't want to be there. His stepbrother doesn't want him there either, nor do half of the camp staff and about 85% of the fellow campers. The film opens with three campers trying to light farts, which is just a terrible opening in and of itself. But then Alan barges into the scene, demands to try lighting a fart himself, bullies the lighter off one of the campers and almost immediately shits himself. Angry that people are laughing at him shitting himself, despite the fact he barged into the scene of his own accord and demanded that this happen, he then threatens to use a nearby spray can as a flamethrower to take out the campers, and the cabin too, if they don't stop laughing at him. Alan is a psychopath. He then gets restrained by counsellors. Honestly, most of the film is literally Alan being a dick and then either running off because he can't win when other campers and staff challenge him, or being restrained. The next day, Alan bullies another kid and starts a bit of a mini food fight in the canteen. He gets restrained again. And then it's time to introduce Angela to the film. Oh yeah, Angela's in the first 20 minutes or so of this movie wearing a disguise that wouldn't fool the Mystery Machine gang, let alone paying cinema goers. I'd say the film tries to make both Alan and one of the only camp staff who's sympathetic to him out to be the movie's killers, but trying implies that they, well, tried. They don't. Felisa Rose was credited as having been in this film since it more or less started filming, so it was inevitable that she was going to be playing Angela. It's just such a waste of time that they decide to do things this way by having her in this movie in disguise because it means that, well, she really does sod all until the last five minutes or so of the movie. Anyway, I'm letting the incoherence of this film distract me. Angela's disguised as a security officer who uses a robot voice box to hide her own voice. She's introduced as having been drafted into the camp for security and to talk to the campers about the dangers of smoking. She's roundly ignored and picked on. When Alan refuses to eat the food served to him, he tips his food away and goes into the staff-only kitchen to ask for an ice cream for dinner. He's refused, so he retaliates by being a right royal clunge to the assistant chef, who pelts him with eggs. Alan retaliates by throwing a fucking kitchen knife at the guy, before running off. Angela later breaks into the kitchen and deep fries the assistant chef before hiding the body. When the head chef, played by Isaac Hayes, returns and can't find his assistant anywhere, he reports it to the head camp counsellor who tells him not to worry about it and to keep it to himself. Alan then tries to chat up his crush in the film, who rejects him because he stinks. This is because he's been walking around for hours with the eggs that the assistant chef threw at him still all over him. And quite rightly, one of the other female campers politely tells him to sod off. The rest of the film is quite literally this kind of one-note farce. Alan barges his way into a scene, is a dick to someone in a highly irritating way, they mess with him as a get-back for the aforementioned dickery, and then Angela turns up and kills whoever tried to pick on Alan. All the while, we're occasionally reintroduced via small cameos to some of the characters who survived the first Sleepaway Camp movie. Because references to better movies always make your movie look better. I am not joking when I say that that plot setup makes up about 70 minutes of this film's 90 minute runtime. It's only in the third act we see anything like a change in pace, and even that isn't saying much. So just before the hour mark, the campers decide that they're fed up with Alan's crap, so they hatch a plan to get back at him once and for all. They get his crush to trick him into going into the camp's theatre, and while in the back room, a load of campers rush him, strip him down to his undies and hogtie and blindfold him. They then dump him on stage in a spotlight where the rest of the campers laugh at him. Alan is both blind with rage and genuinely blind. He runs off into the night where he's found passed out. A few of the camp staff take him back to his room, and while there, a small army of campers hiding behind trees and cabins start chanting, Blowjob, as a really rubbish nickname they decided to give Alan for almost no reason. Seriously, it's based on a passing conversation near the start of the movie that should have begun and ended there. 
The chants wake Alan up and tip him over the edge, and for the last 20 or so minutes of the movie, he vanishes. Brilliant! Well, not really. While any other Sleepaway Camp movie is drastically improved without an Alan, this movie basically goes from being a 1 out of 10 to a 1 and a half. In the final act, Angela tries to kill Alan's crush for leading Alan on. Alan's stepbrother puts two and two together and gets five and decides Alan's the killer, so he heads out to kill Alan before Alan kills again. Then Alan's crush goes out to find Alan's stepbrother and the other camp staff head out to find all three of them. Meanwhile, Angela continues to pick off the remaining campers and staff, and this all builds up to a completely underwhelming and bizarre finale that completely and totally wore out the last goodwill I had for this picture. As if after the first 11 minutes I had any of that left, anyway. Right, so I take it you've got a flavour for why I hate this movie. But let's get to the nitty gritty, and I'm going to preempt what I'm about to say because this at times may sound a little overly personal, so from here on in, this is all my own personal opinion. I can't afford another lawsuit. Anyway, the script's bland, uninteresting, and totally out of touch with the modern age. I don't know what Hiltzik was thinking when he wrote this, but I'm assuming it began with the thought, what do the kids find cool these days? I don't know what happened to the man's writing ability, but it sure as hell isn't here for this film. For a writer who gave us the line, eat shit and die, eat shit and live, and baldies, nearly all the exposition here relates to asses and penises, and that's about it. Alan's dialogue is rambly and incoherent for the most part, and the dialogue's just insufferable. It's incredibly juvenile, to the point that it almost feels like they've miscast all the campers by about five years. No one has anything interesting to say in any way, shape or form. The plot structure's almost non-existent, to the extent that it's literally just the same setup and scene repeated effectively over and over and over again, just in different locations and with slight tweaks to the dialogue. Seriously, you could cut this film up into its individual scenes and rearrange all of them apart from the end scene and the scene where Alan snaps, and they'd sit perfectly in any order. That's not a sign of a well-crafted script. The worst part of the scripting, and full spoilers here, no one gets resolution or closure in this script. It's not like Alan saves the day and takes out Angela in the end. It's not like the campers see a side to him that makes him more popular, and it's not like any of the returning cast members suddenly get to make a heroic move either. Nope. Alan gets knocked to the ground, Angela does a maniacal laugh, and the film just stops. It doesn't end, it just stops. And after spending 90 minutes building to that point, praying that the awfulness would at least give way to a reasonable payoff, it really was a final fuck you to anyone who had any faith in this film. Just truly awful. I don't really know how best to broach this, as it kind of straddles the line between scripting and performance, but all the kid campers in this movie are about five years too old. The script to me feels like they should be obnoxious 13 to 14 year olds, but instead most of these kids look like they're in college. And whereas an irritating or obnoxious character like Alan would maybe, maybe just about work if his dialogue was coming out of a 13 year old, Alan's clearly at least 17 years old, which just makes this whole thing utterly insufferable, as these are adults pretending to be kids. The rest of the performances are no better. All the counsellors have that TV movie of the week vibe going on in the performances, and the two or three returning cast members, Ricky and Ronnie are of particular note, are completely and totally tonally out of place in this thing. They're aiming to recapture that early 80s slasher vibe, but everyone else around them is doing modern style acting. Badly. So as a result, it suddenly feels like a time hole has opened up whenever these characters appear. The only two actors in this movie who give anywhere near a decent performance are Felisa Rose as Angela, who only actually plays Angela for the last two minutes of the film, but she's great, and Isaac Hayes as the chef. But even he doesn't get a break, because about halfway through the film he just disappears and is never heard from or seen again. This was Isaac Hayes' last full feature acting credit. 
He did cameo in another film shortly before his death, but to go out on such a terrible, terrible movie is just awful, really. The direction's completely lacklustre, it's all fixed shots with very, very rare instances of pans or tilt shots thrown in. That's it. There's no hands-free, no creative usages of the cast, and a minimal use of the set environment. Considering this is supposed to be a summer camp, there really isn't that much fun in the sun going on. You really couldn't get more plonk the camera down in action if you tried. The cast are usually set up in clusters, and they rarely give them much to do while inside the frame other than stand there and get their lines out. More annoyingly, Hiltzik appears to have recycled some of the more iconic moments from his earlier directed work into this one. In a better film, used sparingly, that could have been a nice little easter egg, but here it's unbearably trite. It feels less like a nod and a wink to the audience, and more as if he's shouting, Hey, remember this scene from the original Sleepaway Camp? Isn't that a great movie? It gets old quickly, and adds nothing of value to what's already a fairly generic directorial affair. The cine doesn't fare much better either, in fairness. It feels like I'm watching an early 90s episode of the Mighty Morphing Power Rangers at times. Or the cine has that weird early to mid 90s live action kids TV vibe about it, and I don't know if that was done intentionally to try and be nostalgic, or whether Hiltzik literally hasn't directed anything since 1983. But because of these choices, it makes the overall cine for the film feel really flat and drab. And whereas watching this type of cine on TV for 30 minutes is just about fine, when your movie's nearly 90 minutes long, it really begins to grate when you realise that this is about as good as it's going to get from the cine perspective. It's largely mids, group shots, or at most a head and shoulder shot here and there. It's all by the numbers, and nothing particularly shone out to me. The OST... Oh god, as if things could get any worse, Luke. I don't know who decided in the early 2000s that all horror films need a heavy rock or metal soundtrack, but that person needs to be fed out of an airlock. The original Sleepaway Camp had a mostly orchestral score, with one or two synth pieces thrown in for good measure. The opening title theme to return to Sleepaway Camp is mortifying. It's the most generic middle-of-the-road rock you could stick in a horror film like this, and the soundtrack doesn't improve from here. It basically flicks between heavy-ish, super generic and embarrassing rock, and what sounds like horror stings fresh out of YouTube's audio library. It's just really, really cringeworthy. On top of that, there's no nudity, no properly gory horror scenes, and when they decide to go for gore, the effects are awful. Seriously, they're all either CGI'd out the wazoo, or they couldn't afford or think creatively of ways to get victims from their pre-death to post-death faces, so quite often, they'll just completely cut away to something else, then cut back. Like that's supposed to be impressive, and all these death scenes are more or less done from a distance, so you never feel connected to any of the deaths on screen, and you never feel that sharp, stomach-churning unease that the first film had in spades. In short, they're very poor and only go on to make the film worse. It's fair to say that, to me, Return to Sleepaway Camp isn't very good. I don't quite think it's the worst film I've ever seen in my life, but it's definitely a top three contender, and after this I'm sure as hell never watching it again. A massively wasted opportunity with an unlikable and annoying cast, an out-of-touch script that feels like it's trying to appeal to the fanboys way too hard, bland and uninspired direction, kids' TV-style cine, an abysmal OST, a plot that could have literally been hacked to bits and it wouldn't have made a difference, and Alan. I hate Alan. Seriously. As a rule, I try to be constructive with film reviews, so I thought about a few ways that they could have saved this film, or at least made it significantly less awful. First would be recasting the campers so they're actually kids, not older teens. A lot of the dialogue is very reliant on juvenile humour, and if the cast were the correct age, I'd say about 12 to 14 for younger campers and 16 to 18 for older campers, the dialogue might have worked a lot better with them. Or at least it wouldn't have been quite so annoying and a bit more understandable because of their ages. 
Second, go Friday the 13th Part 5 on this script and set it in a rehabilitation camp, or a camp for people who suffer from mental or physical disabilities. Yes, it would be slightly insensitive to do this in the year 2020, but at least in 2008 they'd have had the innocence of not knowing any better to give it leeway. It would have explained away a lot of the erratic behaviour of the campers, it would explain why they have a specialist security on site and tough staff on hand, and it would explain how Angela ended up at the camp, as she'd only recently escaped from a nearby asylum that probably had this camp on their records. Which works a hell of a lot better as an idea than she just decided to go there because of what happened 25 years previously. Thirdly, Angela. Her whole existence in this film needs reworking. Having her in disguise for an hour and 19 of this 90 minute runtime is just awful and really takes away from what could have been a genuinely memorable comeback. She's so obviously Angela from the moment she appears on screen, why go to the trouble of badly hiding the fact? Just put Angela in the movie. Now I'm not saying they need to go full Sleepaway Camp 2 and go zany or anything, but I don't know, have her do something. Anything. How about have her break out of the asylum with another female inmate? That inmate could then get a job as a counsellor and lure kids to the woods where the pair of them bump them off. Make it almost cult-like, with Angela indoctrinating her fellow inmate into the idea that kids who indulge in bad behaviour need to be destroyed. That instantly gives her character much, much more to do, and makes her much more interesting while also allowing some new blood to come into the franchise. It might have even revived it a bit. And that's just three ideas off the top of my head, I'm not even really trying. Here's an end of season challenge for all you regulars out there. Go and find a copy of this movie and give it a spin. See how long you can last before it makes you pause it and go and look out of a window wistfully. If you can make it through the whole thing, let me know. I'd love to hear what you guys made of this. If you liked it, well, there's no helping some people.